Welcome back to Mike and Maurice's Mind Escape. Let us help you escape your mind. Welcome back to Mike and Maurice's Mind Escape. We have episode number 177 tonight, uh, DMT Quest with John Chavez. Uh, John just uh, created a an amazing documentary. It's on YouTube. I have the link down below. You can also check out his website, dmtquest.org. And uh, I again, I highly recommend the documentary. It's uh, it's very good, and I learned a few things, and I you know, know a lot about these subjects. So it's definitely worth checking out. Um, also you can check us out on Patreon at patreon.com slash mind escape podcast for just $2 a month. You'll get exclusive content, um, guest episodes and segments. Uh, you know, we've got stuff on there, Randall Carlson and Sean Cahill and, uh, Laird Scranton, Dr. Gregory Little, tons of people on there. So go check that out. Um, and also check out, go to indrasweb.org. Uh, Indra's web is the social media platform that we created to connect open minds. So if you like to speculate, hypothesize, theorize on interesting topics, whether it's fringe or mainstream, whatever it is, uh, Indra's web is the perfect place for that. I want to bring people together, get visionary thinkers, you know, people that think outside the box and, uh, get them all together in one place and hopefully create a nice community of, uh, positive, uh, visionary thinkers. So go again, go to indrasweb.org and check that out. So, uh, but without further ado, welcome on the show, John. Thanks a lot for having me, man. I'm really, I really appreciate you guys taking the time to put me on. Uh, oh. thanks for the kind, kind words about the documentary as well. Of course. Well deserved, my friend. Yeah, you did an amazing job. Um, and uh, what I liked about it, as we were mentioning before, is uh, I liked how you used the pop culture references and the clips and the, you know, you've got the Mike Tyson stuff and the Joe Rogan and the Wim Hof and Dr. Strassman and, you know, all the big stuff on there. So I, I liked that and that kind of like, I thought it like lured maybe your casual viewer in and then you hit them with the hard science towards the middle and the end, which I really enjoyed. And that's actually the part that I learned the most from. Um, so why don't you talk a little bit to like, was that a design of the documentary to do it that way? Or is that just kind of how it came together? Yeah, no, it actually was the design. Cause I, I saw that over the years, the popularity of DMT was just continuing to build. And it really popped with the Mike Tyson thing in 2019. And, you know, I figured that, you know, with that popularity, we might see more scientific research into this interesting field of discovery. But it wasn't happening. Even after the study got published, that, that study that was highlighted in the documentary that Dr. John Dean spearheaded, you know, you figure that it was such an interesting sort of data that was generated from it that the public would somehow find a way to support this research. But there was a disconnect taking place, and that's why I decided to go ahead and obviously create the nonprofit, uh, create the documentary, and try to go ahead and, and utilize that, that public interest in DMT and hopefully leverage that into some fundraising for these scientists so we don't have to wait six years in between uh, studies like we saw. You know, I mean, GMO produced the 2013 study about the pineal gland and DMT, and then we had to wait a whole another six years for Dean to go ahead and push out a study. And by the way, he needed to take a student loan just to carry out that study because GEMA wasn't getting funding from the NIH to, to do it. So uh, I think that it's a very much needed field of research that needs a lot of support. So yeah, I'm, I'm hoping that the documentary hit that note. That was the one thing I was actually going to ask you about too, was the the 2013 pineal study because when we had uh rick strassman on i we were talking about um how like the newer study the induced cardiac arrest and how the dmt was produced in all of the brain and not just the the pineal his thought was maybe through experimentation maybe there was some error like maybe some of the dmt was being dragged or somehow contaminated into the pineal so i mean did you talk about that at all in terms of you know, with John or 
any of the researchers that it maybe you know it's produced obviously i think in the one part you talk about the other two parts of the brain that it's produced so it's produced in other parts of the brain but um was there any talk of maybe like some sort of cross contamination kind of a thing in terms of like like i said like how they extracted it like could it do they know for sure it's, it comes from the pineal or could there be some sort of scientific error in that based on the later studies well, I guess there's two parts of the conversation. One is that the 2019 study pretty much supersedes any pineal discussion or sort of controversy because, you know, the initial controversy regarding the pineal gland was whether that little gland could produce enough DMT uh, to be dispersed throughout the brain and create a subsequent effect. Mm. Now that we know that DMT and the enzymes necessary to produce DMT are basically found throughout the brain, cerebral cortex, choroid plexus, as well as the pineal gland. It kind of takes that whole speculative aspect out in terms of putting so much on that gland itself. So that's just my perspective of it. But in, in the vein of consistency, you know, in terms of measuring neurochemistry and postulations based on that, I mean, if the enzymes are found co-localized in the pineal gland and the metabolites of DMT are found in the pineal gland, it seems very likely that DMT is produced in the pineal gland, but it's almost irrelevant at this point based on the 2019 study. Does that right. make any sense? Yeah, yeah. And it could, you know, to that point, it could just be produced in general in certain parts of the body and not, I, what it comes down to is I think most people because of like, you know, Joe Rogan and other people, like he always talks about the pineal. He, oh, you know, there's always that reinforcement of that idea. So when you see like the general fan or the general um, psycho not, you know, that's not reading the scientific research or keeping up with the latest stuff, they talk about it. They always bring up the pineal. And I, when we were talking to Rick Strassman, he seemed to um, think that while obviously that was part of his studies, he studied the pineal gland and, um, um, in, in that regard, he also was curious about, you know, that aspect of it. I don't know. I'd have to go back and listen to exactly what he said, but uh, it was somewhere along the lines of, he wondered if it was what I said, some sort of, uh, experimental thing, or if, you know, like maybe however they extracted it from the pineal, that was somehow you know, something else from another part of the brain was brought in there. But I guess, it, like you said, it doesn't really matter at this point. And the fact that the enzymes are there should, you know, put that to rest. Yeah, you know, that's the thing, right? With pop culture and popularity, things get out there and they're not, you know, a thousand percent scientific, which in, in general, I don't have too much issue with if there's more data being generated. That's what I'm saying. Thank God for that 2019 study, because mm -hmm. it gives us a much clearer picture of what's actually going on. and obviously there's still a long way to go in terms of deciphering, you know, establishing DMT as a full on neurotransmitter, uh, the native receptors for DMT, maybe uh, diving into the aspects of 5-MeO-DMT as well, because obviously that's a powerful compound produced in the brain, right. utilizing the same enzymes as DMT. So it's, uh, it's an interesting field, but we, we, there's a long way to go in terms of having a true understanding and putting it on the same level of understanding as serotonin or dopamine. Right. And uh, that brings me to the next question I had was, again, I, I forget what exactly you called it in the document or what the, the researcher called it in the documentary, but the idea that all psychedelics are being, are possibly playing off of DMT that's being produced in the brain. So, you know, even psilocybin, LSD, whatever it is, um, while they're different compounds and alkaloids, uh, they're all kind of being reduced to, you know, almost being filtered through this DMT experience, meaning that the slight differences could just be the other compounds or alkaloids. Yeah, I mean, I look at the brain as uh, operating almost like a sound equalizer where you have so many channels correlating with different neurotransmitters or neurohormones that, you know, they, they balance and imbalance leading to our changes in perception. Uh, the study that you're referring to was an unpublished study that was worked on by Dr. Stephen Barker with his, his uh, lab partner at the time, I, I, I believe. And his lab partner ended up uh, passing away prematurely so that's why they couldn't actually publish the study but they administered lsd to rats 
and they they found that uh, during their the rats LSD experience, their endogenous DMT was increased 400% in the brain, and the endogenous 5-MeO DMT was increased 1,000% in the brain, leading him to postulate that there is an endogenous hallucinatory system, and that psychedelics are acting as endogenous hallucinatory agonists uh, rather than acting as the sole catalyst for the experience. So, you know, another thing to take into consideration as well, since we're on the topic is, you know, in Rick Strassman's trial, when he injected people with DMT intravenously and they had their subsequent effects, it caused a massive spike in basically everything he measured except for melatonin. So th there was a huge chemical cascade effect. This also points to the fact that not even DMT in pure form is necessarily creating the effect solely on its own, if that makes any sense. Yeah. It's and causing a... That was what he was initially studying too, right? It was melatonin. That's what he was initially interested in. And then from there, that's how he got into the whole DMT thing. But it, I think his yeah. initial studies were on melatonin uh, being produced by the pineal. Um, and actually... Uh, to your other point about what you were just talking about, about kind of DMT being the catalyst for all these experiences. I mean, even you, you look at uh, psilocybin. Psilocybin, when it's broken down in the gut, turns into psilocin. And then psilocin, I think, is only one molecule away from DMT itself. So it's not like that far of a stretch, that, that hypothesis. Yeah, no, exactly. And you go even deeper, right, into... Uh the endogenous monoamine oxidase inhibitors, uh, people aren't really aware that the body produces various forms of monoamine oxidase inhibitors. So now I use the term endowaska as a kind of a play off ayahuasca referring to endogenous ayahuasca hmm. because we produce, you know, DMT, 5-MeO DMT, and then monoamine oxidase inhibitors like tribulin, pinaline, neurocatin, and even acetylcholine, the first neurotransmitter discovered has been shown to have monoamine oxidase inhibitory properties. So it's a very complex uh, soup that's going on in the brain during these altered states. So I'm really looking forward to the data that's going to be coming out of Michigan and possibly other labs in the coming years to get a better understanding of the neurochemical basis for these altered states. Have you talked to anybody about like maybe that's why? So if you take like some people have experiences on like Peganum, Harmala, or Harmala, um, that that's just disabling that's obviously the maoi but that since it's dmt is already in the body that that might be what the experience is then or yeah absolutely i mean it's part of it right i mean uh syrian rube peganum harmala isn't gonna just uh, suppress the breakdown of dmt it's gonna suppress the breakdown of all monoamine neurotransmitters serotonin dopamine norepinephrine as well so it's um it's a complex situation, but yes, absolutely. I, I'm actually a big fan of uh, Syrian Rue. I think that uh, mm. it offers therapeutic potential and opportunity for people looking for that in a legal manner. Because unless I'm mistaken, I do believe it's, it's legal uh, throughout many parts of the world. Yeah, I mean, I'm not aware of the legality of but I know yeah, it's I know obviously that's one of the more prevalent ones. And it's found throughout, you know the uh the mediterranean and i think parts of the middle east and stuff so um so when you look at this documentary just exploded you had all these amazing people retweeting talking about it you know you had dennis mckenna you had uh um you know i don't even know who else. a lot of the big hitters from the the big i think boys. maybe grand Han graham hancock tweeted about it too you know so you had a lot of people um helping you out with that but i think that you can't just have that. You have to have a good, good product, product or a good, yeah, like, a, you know, the documentary. So I think the documentary was good. And then you have all these, you know, big names helping out. And I think that's kind of probably what pushed it over the edge. But um, so did you, did you know any of these people or are these just people that um, they saw the documentary and were impressed by it and then spread the word? Yeah, I'm actually friends with Dennis McKenna. So okay. we've we've been in contact over the years. I met him at a Tiringham, Tiringham Hall in the UK, I believe in 2017 or 2018. And we've been friends ever since, just keeping in contact. He knows I'm really interested in the endogenous DMT field of research. So mm. I'm friends with Dennis. I'm not personal friends with Graham, but 
I know some people that have been in contact with him, and I really appreciate him putting it out there. And then as well as Alex Gray. I met Alex a oh, couple yeah. years ago in New York, and he was a really good dude. So appreciate that love as well. And then and Wim Hoff put it out. I'm, I'm personal friends with Wim. We've been friends for about five years. So it's That's um awesome. it's good to have it finally come together. I mean, this is something that, you know, I've been really – talking with Wim about for five years and uh, I'm sure at some point he thought I was just probably <laughs> going to let it die and not going to let right. it happen but nah I, I just I always had it in my mind that I was going to make something of like this vision and uh, after that 2019 study I was like okay we can make something happen right. how long did it take you guys to make that the film from front to back uh, we got the funding last March so two, 2020 March and uh, the final, final, final cut was, uh, I would say, probably the first week of January. So, yeah, whatever that is, nine months, ten months. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, you did a great job. And actually, uh, you know, Maurice and I are trying to get in the documentary uh, game ourselves. Um, but I thought that, you know, looking at what you did, I th- you you definitely did all the research, which is good. I think that there's a lot of people that make these movies and they don't fully comprehend or understand what they're putting out there, right? So, uh, but it seemed like you knew you had an, a vision, an idea, and then you put it together. And actually, we were going to have you on the podcast, I don't know, what is it, like six months ago? And I just got sidetracked, you know, like life happens, the times weren't lining up. But um, I'm really glad that you're on now, and I think... Uh, I think this documentary is just like I said, you just did a, a really, really amazing job. So, and I'm happy for you too. I, I think that this is obviously a big step to helping you um, achieve your goals and what you want to do with this. Right on. I appreciate that, man. You know, the thing is too, is that uh, I've actually written two books on the subject, utilizing something close of like 1200 peer reviewed sources. So, you know, it's not like I just had a vision for a documentary. It was like, Right. You know, I've I've been writing about this in a certain format that it seems to resonate with people. And um, I basically had a vision to kind of synthesize just a small part of it. Um, There's going to be a lot on the way. That's all I got to tell you guys in terms of uh, documentaries. I see the DMT quest thing going on pretty much indefinitely. Hmm. Um, I'd like to do more documentaries about upcoming research, but also periphery research regarding altered states. I, I believe that that this field has a lot to offer. Um, I want to delve. Go people ahead. check out his book too. I was going to say your book you mentioned is the questions uh, for the lion tamer, and it's on your web. It's on the dmtquest.org if people are interested. Yeah, so I got questions for the lion tamer one and two, and uh, it really delves into the nitty gritty aspects. You know, obviously I'm speculating a lot on the the biomechanics of altered states and the potential for the for humans that are, are is pretty dormant, you know, I think in most, but when altered states come about, it seems as though some of our potential comes about. And that's really my, uh, my passion mm. in terms of seeing that for, for humanity. And I think Wim Hof has been doing a, a great job of bringing it back to the basics of how to get people into altered states with the breath. And we can carve out a lot from there. So I'm really excited for the future of humanity, you know, not just DMT quest, but, just uh, the trajectory of where I see we can go. Mm. I feel like, you know, the sky's literally the limit. So I'm just uh, looking forward to producing more and, you know, working with guys like you to, to push it out there. And if you guys have any ideas that you guys need, you know, some advice on or whatever, you know, we can bounce it back and forth. Yeah, man, it's inspiring. Like I said, we're trying to get into the documentary stuff. I mean, it's something we've been talking about for a few years, like since we started doing this podcast three years ago. But yeah. um obviously the circumstances of the world have changed and things are a lot different. So, um, you know, traveling around to interview people, we have to kind of get more creative about stuff. So, you know, we were talking about maybe doing an NDE because my, you know, my mom had a real traditional near death experience and we know a couple other people and oddly enough, I've reached out to a lot of people, um, to see if anybody to interview who have had a real near death experience, but also have, experienced DMT in a DMT trip. And I got a lot of pushback on that. Um, even though now the science is actually, uh, you know, the cardiac induced, you know, rats that the U of M study and everything, 
um, are kind of validating that. I got a lot of pushback. People are, oh, it's completely different. It's nothing like it. Uh, they're two completely different things, blah, 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 blah. Um, but the more and more I look at it, I see a lot of crossover. What do you think? Absolutely. I mean, listen, I, from what I understand, I, I have a lot of respect for Dr. Even Alexander, but he's been one of the biggest uh, proponents of saying that there is sort of like no physiological correlate to the mystical experience and the near death experience. But I don't necessarily know if that's true because, you know, we have time dilation when we do these powerful psychedelics. So, you know, mm -hmm. maybe you can have a burst of DMT in a split second that allows you to go ahead and perceive the world in a very different format of time. So when we look at linear time from the outside in and, uh, you know, we look at a flat line brain, a flat heart and, and all that, then, you know, we postulate that, look, you know, there's there's nothing correlated with the brain activity or anything with the body. So it can't be, you know, DMT related. There can't, there can't be any B physical mechanisms related. It has to be straight mystical. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that might not necessarily be true. It might be a, a lot more complicated, obviously, right. than, than that. I don't think it's so cut and dry. And at the same time, you know, when somebody wants to say a near death experience, uh, was just a hallucination of the mind. You know, I don't think it's that simple as as well. I think it's it's somewhere in between, right? And a well, lot I, and a lot lot more complicated than all of that. I think you're actually kind of right on. I have similar sentiments. Actually, we've had Doctor Evan Alexander on the show before. We and we've also had Doctor Penny Sartori, and I've asked both of them about the DMT correlation, and they both kind of not dismissed it necessarily, but they didn't think that that was the case. Um, and I think that why they point to it is like things that happen in those experiences that are like synchronistic to like life that only certain parts of like only some out exterior force could have enabled some sort of connection. If does that make sense? Like, mm -hmm. um, there's things happening metaphysically that couldn't just be of this material realm that have some sort of importance that's unknown. Yeah, I mean, listen, I would say that that's probably true, but at the same time, there could be the possibility that that metaphysical correlation has something to do with maybe, I mean, look, like the Michael Persinger research indicates that really ultra-weak magnetic fields can cause, you know, hallucinatory activity, and one of his hypotheses was that it upregulated endogenous DMT, and that's what caused the mystical visionary experience, so... Who to say that the metaphysical experience has taken place in quote unquote the spirit world doesn't have some sort of uh, physical magnetic sort of uh, correlation that actually is inducing you know the the neurochemical uh, effects? So it's yeah it's, yeah I'm a big proponent on that. I've said that for a while now. Uh, oh, yeah. that uh, that uh, like so magnetic disturbance correlates with the uh, like metaphysical mystical sort of situations. Just that, the, you know, the near-death experiences have something to do with uh, the body releasing some DMT. And that I, I, I think that the DMT can connect us to the, to the next realm, if you will. Yeah, I mean, like, listen, especially from a conversation standpoint, right? Never in the history of the world has, have we had a compound like this that basically is a, a blanket term for all mysticism. Um, you know, based on the fact that it's producing the body and obviously it produces very profound effects when ingested from outside the body. But that's what I'm saying, not just from a straight scientific perspective, but also a conversational perspective. You know, part of me feels as though it's conversation that really runs the world. And if mm -hmm. people can't even begin to have a conversation about something, then, you know, it's pretty much dead. It's dead on arrival. So that's what I find pretty interesting about the DMT discussion is that it breaks down a lot of doors, opens up a lot of horizons and perspectives to these mystical type experiences. I mean, one of the other interesting aspects of the near-death experience is a phenomenon studied by Raymond Moody called the shared death experience. I don't know if you guys have heard about that. Yeah, I've read Life After Life, and uh, yeah, I've seen him talk about that. Yeah, so I mean, you know, it leads you to ask more questions, right? Like exactly how does that take place? Mm -hmm. One person has like literally, you know, they're in the process of dying and then 
somebody's right next to them and they have a crossover with the other person's hallucinatory experience. So there has to be some sort of uh, bonding between the two. There has to be some sort of possibly magnetic resonance or, or something of that nature that allows somebody to basically see the experience of another. Hmm. I mean, I don't know if you guys have read uh, James, o- James O'Rock, uh, O'Rock's book, uh, Trip to Mean Palace where he talks about a similar sort of experience with 5-MeO-DMT. And, I, uh, he had I a, have not read it, but I, I'm aware of him and an obviously RIP. That's yeah, yeah, rest story. in peace, Rock, man. Hey, he was a good dude. I met him in New York a couple of years ago, and he's very much missed in the space. Um, but he wrote about a similar experience with 5-MeO-DMT where he ingested 5, and then he had somebody, one of his uh, good friends, uh, trip sitting him, and she ended up seeing uh, overlap with his experience. So, hmm. you know, these things are intriguing based on the fact they, that yes, there are chemical aspects involved, but there seems to be some sort of force possibly generated by this chemical upregulation that allows for these strange situations to take place. Yeah. And you mentioned before like time dilation and gravity. And um, I mean, there's obviously the, the uh, atomic clock, Uh, experiment that they've done where you know they drop the clocks from different you know uh altitudes and the more gravity there or the more um yeah the more gravity there is the more time slows down so then what does that mean physiologically you know like are we connected to the external world in some way that's unknown because how could those two things be the same and yet we can have psychedelic experiences and experience that same thing that's happening in the external world? Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's it's really complex, especially the concept of time and altered states. It just, uh, certain things don't match up linearly and uh, I have no way to explain it. I'm not really, uh, I'm just a filmmaker and an author, <laughs> man. I, I don't really know much. <laughs> No, man. I mean, look, you know your shit. You read the the scientific papers. I mean, look, I do that for our show. I read anytime there's some new uh, psychedelic science paper out there or archaeological paper, you know, like whatever we cover on our podcast, which is generally like a handful of topics, usually having to do with like metaphysics and altered states and that kind of stuff. But, you know, I think it's important to read this stuff and to understand. So even if you want to have to take an alternative view and say, oh, it's this mystical thing happening or it's that spiritual thing happening. I think it's important to know what the mainstream science says about it so you know if there's actual holes or if you're just believing in something to believe in something. So I, like, that's always been my philosophy is I want to know both sides of it so I can deduct you know, who's full of shit and who's not. I got you. Absolutely. I mean, I try to do the same thing. Maybe I went like I go a little bit more focused on trying to carve out an argument for the mystical from mainstream science. Mm. I feel like maybe that's something that I've kind of been known for. I don't know. I don't know what the perception of me right. is, but uh, that's kind of what I presented because uh, you know one of the interesting things is when you look throughout history, especially like the early 1900s. I mean, it seemed as though much of the world was immersed in mysticism. Mm-hmm. and seances and all sorts of strange phenomena yeah. and then somewhere along the line it seems like that kind of fell off a little bit obviously in the 60s we saw the psychedelic surge and for whatever reason it seems like there's a psychedelic re- renaissance taking place right now and maybe people are dipping their foot back into the mysticism so it's it's an interesting time in history that's for sure yeah and you, you're actually right about that, too. and That's something I've been kind of focused on recently, too, is the that n- around the early 1900s, there was a ton of um, occult, you know, um, not just uh, authors, but like researchers and people kind of putting esoteric stuff out there that you actually don't really see too much of. You know, it's kind of gotten away from that. But there's... Um, there's a lot of stuff, I think good stuff in there. If you can, there's a lot of stupid stuff too, but um, I think if you can like discern what's good and what's bad, I think there's a lot of interesting stuff that came out of that time period for sure. Absolutely. And that, that's right. The challenge of, especially the times we live in is the internal compass, right? Being able to discern, you know, the wheat from the shape or whatever, however they call it, whatever's good. Yeah. From like a pile of nonsense. Yeah. You got to have that discernment, that internal compass to be able to 
at least kind of navigate your own world, your own perspective, because it's, it's so easy to dive down these rabbit holes and, and basically believe everything if you want to. But right. uh, sometimes it could lead us to, uh, you know, I don't know if it's nonsense, but it's uh, it can lead us to some strange perspectives of the world, I think. For sure. What is there anything that you learned during this process of like making this that you were kind of unaware of that maybe you looked over initially or is there anything that you've um learned making it or did you know everything going into making it? You're talking about like the the data and yeah, like things the that data, were like the scientific stuff, anything or even just from interviews and picking stuff up that way. Mm, much of the data I'd been pretty well versed in because like I said I was I was swimming 1200 research papers right, like spe- right. specifically around this topic so I really kind of are, I was more trying to simplify it and not try to go overboard you don't know how many times I've watched the film at night just wondering am I flooding people's brains with too much information uh-huh. you know because for me it was like it's difficult to gauge when you're immersed into space, right? Absolutely. So, yeah. So I know no, you're, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, uh, when, you know, I saw your documentary, like I said, initially it was like, okay, you know, this is some pop stuff. I like those clips. You know, I've seen those episodes of those podcasts and seen, you know, the Wim Hof stuff and seen Dennis McKenna's interview, you know, but then, it took this turn where it's like, Oh, okay, this is some new stuff. And like, you know, it's a different, there's a difference between reading those U of M scientific papers and then actually seeing the scientists that, that worked on them, you know, talk about it, you know? So I think that that adds an additional dimension or layer. Um, and then even on top of that, uh, it sparked some own, some of my own like curiosities and I started theorizing about stuff just from watching your documentary. So like I said, I think it's, you did a great job because it invokes more mystery into the subject. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, one of my main things too, was that I got respect for Strassman, McKenna, all the, the old heads that have been in this space for a long time, but I also feel like it's time for the new scientists to be known. Hmm. I think John Dean's a dynamic character and really fun to talk to really intelligent very measured in, in how he looks at things, very fair scientist, extremely bright. You know, I feel like he needs to be known because I feel like these young guys that are interested in the space are going to be able to help, you know, help the movement on their own, help with fundraising their their own labs and that whole thing. And somehow there was that disconnect, you know, with Strassman and McKenna. They did, they were, it's almost as if they weren't aware that the young researchers needed help with the fundraising. So, I really wanted to make a star. You know, I really wanted the world to know that John Dean existed. I wanted the world to know that Nicholas Glynos was on the come up at University of Michigan. And he's a, a really another intelligent, uh, grounded researcher in, in the DMT field. And people need to know these people exist. They need the support. And uh, if they are supported, I think that we're going to see some some mind blowing things uh, coming out of those labs. And hopefully it'll spark interest with other young researchers. You know, one of the things that I learned that maybe wasn't in the the documentary was talking to Jima Borjigan. Uh, she was this, the neuroscientist that all this research took place in. Unfortunately, she's you know she she didn't really want to be in the documentary itself because okay. uh, she likes to be a little a little bit more of a private life. But uh, she mentioned to me that every year she has a line of PhD candidate students uh, wanting to study endogenous DMT. And because of lack of funding, she has to turn them away. Hmm. And, you know, that's something that a lot of people don't know about science. They have this belief that science within itself is based on efficiency, meaning that if something is inherently interesting in the field of science, it will automatically get funded, you know, basically out of the ether, out of thin air. And that just doesn't happen. Yeah. Um, No, you're you're right on. I mean, I agree with that. We're actually going to have... Avi Loeb, who's a Harvard uh, physicist and uh, um, astronomer, he's going to, you know, he wrote this book, Extraterrestrial, about that Amuabua, um, yeah. you know, uh, object that came through our solar system. They have no idea what it was. And he theorized it could be some sort of extraterrestrial thing or technology or something. But when you hear him talk, he talks about this, you know, this science culture where kind of what you're saying, like a lot of scientists 
um, will only do, you know, go towards what the funding is or, you know, they'll, they'll pick topics that they know they can get funding as opposed to like what's actually interesting or what they're passionate about. Um, and then there's obviously, um, he talks about how it's almost like, um, they're not, scientists aren't serving the public. Like we, we should be being served what we're interested in, like what are most people interested in? That's what science should be shining the light on it as opposed to, oh, this is super fascinating, but we're not going to give anybody any funding on this. Absolutely. I mean, it's a disgrace at this point. And I think the light needs to be shine on it. And that's really what bothers me about, you know, big science per se. There's so much money being wasted in things that are of no consequence. Mm. And I mean, like GMO could have went the easy route and continued studying melatonin and everything around it and continue to get funding. But she took the hard route and she didn't get any funding, but she stuck with it just because she was so passionate about it and intrigued about the possibilities. So, you know, the thing is, scientists, they're they're not marketers, right? They're not filmmakers. Yeah, what, there's not... no millionaires or billionaires out there, though, that are interested in this. I find that hard to believe. You know, like we it, can't get Elon or, somewhere. you know, we got to get somebody. He's on got this. enough on his plate. Tweet that. Tweet that. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, well, I was gonna say send that uh, send the video tweet at Elon and see if you know be like this this needs more funding at U of M or something. See if maybe he'll will do something. I don't know. Yeah, I mean for sure it's uh, it's disgusting to me when you see billionaires out there that talk about building futuristic concepts or whatever, and it's like wait you got to come up off the dime and put some on for endogenous DMT because right. I feel that there's a lot of secrets to be brought to light in terms of not just changes in our, in our perception, but you know, maybe even changes in ability, changes in being able to upregulate our endogenous hallucinatory system to induce increased neuroplastic properties where we can mm-hmm. change our brain structures and change our own perception of the world and, and maybe even change our own internal physiology in ways that we're not really aware of. So mm-hmm. I feel like the, the possibilities are, are relatively limitless to a certain extent. Um, yeah, you know, we got some, like, so- you want to go to Mars? You can go to Mars right now, Elon. Let's yeah. do this, you know? <laughs> um, you, you know, and to, to that point, though, what you were saying is uh, with the whole, um, you know, possibilities and physiological stuff. I mean, I, I agree with that. I think you're, uh, you're spot on with that. Like, why, like, the most important thing we know of is our own consciousness, right? So what if we were to find that, dm you know endogenous dmt production or um you know even if it's on a a smaller level like maybe that has plays some important part of our consciousness that we're unaware of at this point yeah absolutely absolutely i mean the the michigan study that we highlighted in the film seems to allude to that right i mean Mm -hmm. you have a hallucinatory compound floating around in the in the same fluid that you measure serotonin, dopamine, norepinephrine at similar levels. DMT is floating around in there. I mean, why right. do we have a hallucinatory compound floating around in our brains like that? Is is reality, you know, by default, halluc- uh, hallucination? I mean, to me, that sounds like maybe a reasonable sort of conversation. What if they find that 5-MeO DMT is also floating around in similar levels, right? Yeah. I mean, then you have... That's crazy. Yeah, I, that's what I was speculating on when I was watching it. I was like, what if we were like any other mammal before, and then we started ingesting plants and fungi and different things that contain these compounds, and that somehow altered, like you're saying, altered our physiology forever, and that's why we're conscious. That's why we can manipulate our environments like nothing else that we've ever known to exist, you know? So. Yeah, I mean that you're kind of hinting at the stone ape theory from Terry. Well, McKenna. yeah, it's more like the stone, uh, the stone DMT theory. But yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's, I mean, I guess it would be similar, right? Because even if that one uh, theory that you were talking, about, we were talking about earlier, where everything plays off of the DMT um, enzymes in the body, then that the stone ape theory would be technically ripe, right? Because even if it if it was fungi or whatever, it could be anything that has. Uh, those alkaloids or compounds yeah i mean one of the uh um one of the talks i was going to give was when uh, dennis mckenna invited me to speak at terrence mckenna uh, terrence's uh birthday or death anniversary was uh not necessarily something that supersedes the stone ape theory but almost like a complementary theory 
um, I call it the endowaska pole shift theory of evolution, where it seems clear based on the, all the data that I've read that you know very weak fluctuations in very weak magnetic fields cause different secretions throughout the brain wherever it was stimulated. Mm. So theoretically speaking, I mean, just like right now, we're in the middle of a pole shift. This is pretty mainstream. There's nothing woo about that. If you go ahead and right. just Google pole shift, you're going to see that, you know, CNN, Fox, all the, the well, big yeah, news. Well, moving around, coverage. right? Like at a more mm -hmm. rapid rate than normal. Yeah. So what that does is that obviously changes the strength of Earth's magnetic field. From what I understand, it weakens it. And that fluctuation can cause a change in our neurochemical secretion. So what I'm getting at is that over time, instead of the theory of uh, our ancestors, you know, eating psilocybin mushrooms and then that leading to the growth of the right. prefrontal cortex and things of that nature is that uh, throughout history, we know that there's been pole shifts that have taken place rather regularly. And I postulate that these changes in Earth's magnetic field cause uh, significant fluctuations in our neurochemical aspect just at the sub psychedelic level not obviously full on spectrum dmt stuff cuz right. if that happened then basically everybody's dying on the freeway right <laughs> i mean right. it's just it's just too much so right. for whatever reason maybe the force that uh, runs this whole show has been able to create a system where you can basically turn the knob slowly he or she can turn the knob slowly on Earth's magnetic field, which causes a global sort of surge in uh, evolution, or maybe in some cases, de-evolution. I don't know. These mm. are all very strange ideas I'm bringing up right now. <laughs> no, it's not strange to us. We're all into the you know ancient civilization, ancient uh, lost civilization stuff, I and mean, we've that's part of mainly what we do too. And you know, obviously, I don't know if you're familiar with like the younger Dryas impact hypothesis and stuff like that, but. At any point, you know, throughout our history, there's been certain cataclysms that probably had a, a massive effect on us in different ways that we're just probably unaware of at this point. Yeah, there's a good author. I think his name is Robert Seelig. I, I might be butchering his name, but he offers alternative theories to evolution. And a lot of what he presents is it's based on, you know, just regular pole shifts where you know, the pole shifts correlate with cataclysm event, events and obviously everything that I've presented thus far with the, you know, the neurochemical uh, change secretion. So mm. it's hard to say. All I know is that these times don't seem normal. So maybe something's happening. And yeah. so what about your own personal experience with these compounds? Like, you know, is this something that you've been doing for a while or like what's your your history with this? No, actually, I, I could definitely say no in terms of psychedelics. I've tried them, but, you know, to be honest, I, I had a, a non-drug-induced mystical experience in 2013 that uh, led me to asking a lot of questions about, you know, why this stuff isn't known, hmm. um, what are the mechanics of it, can you reverse engineer it, uh, things of that nature. So that that led me down the path of, just trying to find out all the aspects of the body that could correlate with the mystical. Mm. So that led me down, obviously, to you know DMT being thrown in there, but also changes in our brain waves, right? Like anything that was objectively, measurably, uh, that that was altered during these altered states. Was there any sort of correlation with these uh, changes in maybe ability perception? things of that nature and that led me down the rabbit hole of the gamma wave and the eeg stuff so yeah i was gonna say that's a, that's one of the things i learned too from your documentary was the whole different uh uh brain waves uh i mean i obviously knew about the different brain waves but just how it's affected you know with the dmt trip so yeah i mean that thing is huge really uh that's what i really dived down hardcore in my first book was uh tying basically all these sort of altered states with the gamma wave. And the, and the thing is, when, when I, we're referring to gamma wave, we're referring to, I guess, the 35 to 45 hertz, but mm -hmm. it seems as though there offers a possibility that 
some of these experiences are taking place at much higher brain waves that are a little bit difficult to measure. I'm talking about 100 hertz, 200 hertz, maybe right. 500 hertz. So I think once we start to develop technology that can more accurately measure uh, the much faster oscillatory activity, then we're, we're going to get a much clearer picture of how different our neuro, I guess, electrical activity is compared to like our, our normal baseline. And I feel like that's important. It's important for the public to understand that these mystical experiences, I, it would freak me out if somebody was had an EEG you know, cap on and then they smoke DMT and they have this full-blown mystical experience and there's absolutely no change in their EEG. That right. would, to me, would be the epitome of a pure mystical experience, being that it has nothing to do with this 3D reality and how we measure it and how we think that we operate. But the fact of the matter is, is that the brain activity changes immensely. Mm, and that stays consistent with, you know, things like the materialistic aspect of science, which makes this a very interesting conversation to have with the general layperson who maybe isn't a full-blown mystic and maybe leans more towards science, but it it offers some some conversation right there. Yeah, I mean, and, and to that point too, I mean, you could even throw the whole binaural beat thing in there as well, and that maybe, you know, when you meditate to binaural beats or listen to them, uh, you know, the different frequencies, what is it, like alpha is like 10 to 14 hertz or something like that, uh, theta is 4 to 8, you know, so... Um, yeah, and you were talking about gamma, that's 30 to 100, right? So um, I, I'm just thinking about that in, in like, you know, meditation, because there was also, I don't know who was talking about it, but maybe there's something going on with meditation and DMT production as well. Yeah, absolutely. It's interesting. It's almost like a rubber band effect where, um, at least from what I've seen, where you go deeper into the relaxation and then what you start to see is a coupling of the slow wave like a theta or something even a delta with a fast wave like a gamma so the deeper you go into the relaxation then you see a spike a jump and sometimes it, it appears that that correlates with the mystical experience maybe in meditation it definitely correlates with the uh, mystical the intensity of the mystical experience based on the dmt research at least uh, published by uh, enzo tagliazucci from imperial college yeah yeah, I mean, I've asked people, I, when I get deep into meditation, I'm talking like, you know, 45 minutes in or so, uh, in my peripherals, I'll get these fluttering white lights and like they dance around and then sometimes it gets more colorful. Um, but um, they almost kind of look like some sort of, you know, like when you see these like Kalibi Yao manifold, when you're talking about like string theory, it almost kind of looks like that. So, I mean, it would be really wild if we were able to, deep in those states visualize what some of these waves look like or uh, possibly perceive things like that that are not normally there yeah no it's an interesting conversation for sure even when you get into uh i don't know if you've read that paper from mcfadden where i think it was it came out late last year where i think he's more referring to consciousness as an electromagnetic field mm. like that, that's more of the foundation of our consciousness than the the fleshy, spongy, neurochemical experience taking place in the brain. The the thing that's closer to consciousness is more like a, a magnetic field. And, you know, to be quite honest, I, I kind of resonate with that. But, you know, it, it's all intertwined. It's all part sure. of the big orchestra. Well, I mean, the way things are set up in reality is the stuff that's break breakthrough and visionary that we're talking about right now we're going to look like idiots in 100 years to, to other people you know Absolutely. so <laughs> then th yeah. there's that's that you can't argue i mean even if you know you that look always at happens isaac newt you know even people now with einstein you know they're trying to you know debunk stuff that he's done you know so it's just um it's this ever evolving thing it's almost like we're sisyphus ever pushing the boulder up the mountain kind of a thing so and it's almost like we're just doing our part to further this you know this mystical journey uh, through life. But um, I wanted to ask you too, we were talking about papers. Have you read the one about uh, crystals being found in the pineal gland, like different shaped crystals? There's cylinder crystals and cone shaped crystals. 
and almost like uh, I think it was connected to almost like what a piezo electrical uh, or you know piezo thing happening where it's picking up vibrations. Uh, did you? And I want to say we had Tom Lane on, and he was talking about it how um, they crushed it and found like UV the UV spectrum in it, or there was some I don't know something weird like that. But um, basically, what it comes down to is. I think this paper was talking about how there's crystal, you know, how you have like your, like autoconia, like the stuff that's in your ears for, to help keep balance or whatever, you know, Mm -hmm. same thing, I guess, is what they found in the pineal gland is these little crystals that pick up vibration. So I think that that's kind of interesting too. And I think that stuff like that needs to be researched more. Yeah. I mean, I, I've come across that paper. I don't remember the exact details of it, but. That's another interesting facet, especially when you're looking at consciousness from a magnetic perspective. Absolutely. You know, the the one controversy, I guess, for myself reading about uh, the crystals in regards to the pineal gland was uh, that was, I mean, the whole calcification aspect of the pineal gland. And uh, is that, was the calcification aspect of the pineal gland are those the crystals or is it a separate thing entirely? Yeah, I don't know. That's a good point. Um, yeah, like is are those being produced or are those already there? And, you know, yeah, that's a good point. I didn't even think about that. Yeah, so that's how I was a little confused about that because, you know, I've read papers coming out of uh, Russell Ryder's group in Texas. He's basically like the leading authority on melatonin in the pineal gland and they talk about calcification of the pineal gland being a negative based on all the data that they've observed and the research they've observed. And then you have the whole, you know, pineal gland crystal. So, you know, I, I need some some sort of clarification as to what the hell is going on there. <laughs> for sure, for sure. Um, so, and you have a crowdfund set up too. I'll actually put the link down below uh, the video for that too. I had a couple um, questions about the documentary. Oh, go, go did ahead. you uh did you have a plan before going into it? Like were you planning on releasing it on YouTube or what were your thoughts on that? Yeah, no, that was the initial plan to release on YouTube because I want it to be free for the world. Uh-huh. And I don't think there's anything freer than YouTube right now. So right. you know, then you could go Netflix, but and that would have a big audience per se, but I don't know. I, I just like free. I feel like this message is too important. Uh, I don't want to. Did you have any worries about like a kickback, like about some of the stuff you were saying, like they might have an issue with it with some of the algorithms? No, not. I mean, listen. The only thing you could do is do the best you can, let her rip, and deal with the repercussions later. My man, I I like that. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, that's (laughs) that's why I I told Ben, the, the director, I was like, let's let's just make the best thing that we can make, and. Whatever happens after that happens, if we need to edit some stuff out, we can make that change later. But let's present something to the world that, uh, you know, the people will like and it doesn't waste their time. Yeah, no, it's sweet. Yeah, sure. Did you, uh, so you, you set up the crowdfund, so you're going to try and do like a more higher end production for uh, a second, you know, uh, documentary or is it going to be on similar stuff or are you going to evolve this kind of uh research i mean because you have kind of the newest research in there so like what was what's your idea for this next uh documentary yeah, i mean you don't have to share bu- too much if you don't want to but yeah we're gonna build upon it i mean we're gonna stay in the same vein of endogenous dmt discussion but you know we're also gonna you know maybe stretch out a little bit periphery but stay within the eeg studies no no matter what we're looking at I mean, there's so much interesting stuff to dive into regarding concepts like meditation and hypnosis that also seem to induce significant changes in the EEG profile, uh, upregulating gamma gamma wave. But I've also been in discussions with other scientists. So the thing is, the Michigan group focuses on animal studies, and John Dean's now at uh, University of San Diego, and he wants to develop non-invasive way to measure endogenous dmt in the brain and that's going to take years to develop but in the meantime i've been in contact with other scientists that are interested in developing ways to measure fluctuations of endogenous dmt in the blood so obviously if if that happens within the next 
three to six months, then we have content for another documentary um, in terms of maybe verifying whether the Wim Hof method causes an increase in the levels of DMT, 5-MAO DMT in the blood that mm. also correlates with the gamma wave spike. So, I mean, th there's a lot of things that we can go into. Um, probably not going to divulge all of it, but definitely going to keep looking to produce stuff. I mean, the crowdfunding thing is just one thing. It seemed as though, you know, a lot of people in the comments section of various platforms are stating that maybe we could get it started. I just kind of put it out there haphazardly. It's not really my focus right now to necessarily look at crowdfunding as the primary source of driving this. I'm actually working with Anton Bilton. He's one of the, the funders for the documentary that I've known for several years now. And uh, he's keen to help uh, drive some of the fundraising for uh, endogenous DMT research and DMT quests. So, you know, we're looking to extract uh, from the rich and, and give back. I don't necessarily want to take from the people and give back to the people. I'd rather take from the rich and give to the people. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, for I sure. I like that. Yeah, and uh, no, that's, that's a, a great thing. And I think, you know, obviously you want to be compensated, so, but you can do others, you know, there's merch and books and all sorts of other things that you can do to kind of, you know, get that going as well. But yeah, I mean, I think you put a lot of time and passion into it and the fact that you're just putting it out there, I think that's super noble. And I think that, uh, more people should do stuff like that, but I think we live in yeah, a very, some, yeah, it's a, yeah, it's just a better way to look at things, you know, put it out there. If the money comes, it comes, but that shouldn't be a driving force behind you. Right. Yeah, I mean, listen, I figure that if we get something like 10 million views on this film, you know, by the end of the year, we would have hit some people that have the dollars to really fund everything. So that means basically you're going to get more money, um, not for me, but for the research, rather than if you if I charge everybody five dollars for the film right now or something. Right. right. Like, I'm just I'm looking big picture, long vision, uh, how much impact we can make. Also educating the public, I feel like that's important as well. So, yeah, that was that was the the the, the vision the whole time. That's awesome, beautiful. Oh, I, I like that. Um, so yeah, I mean, is there anything else you want to plug here before we wrap it up? Well, I just want to say thanks to you guys, Maurice and Mike, for having me on. You guys seem really well versed in in the space of altered states and just general exploration. So it's exciting to talk to you guys about it because I don't really come across too many people that are are pretty well versed and pretty balanced and and modest in the way they they bring things up. Either it's people I'm discussing with are fully just immersed in science and have little space for other sorts of conversations or I'm having conversations with full-on mystics that have <laughs> uh, no interest in anything scientific. So yeah. right. it was uh, great to connect with you guys. I've seen you guys on social media, so it's good to finally just talk to you guys. And hopefully, uh, you know, I can be back on when we're getting ready to launch the second one, and and we can produce something good for the world. Oh, one hundred percent. We'll have you back on, man. And uh, yeah. You should uh, get on uh, Indra's now too, and I'll give you some juice, and you can. Uh kick your documentary around there there might be some because we got a lot of crossover our uh the, my buddy that i co-created indra's web with uh also created dmt world i don't know if you're familiar with that so yeah um we could probably touch a lot of people right on man yeah i don't even know how that works but i'm sure you can help me uh when we get off the show <laughs> yeah no no for sure but i was just saying like i think that uh you know i think what we're trying to do is cultivate kind of what you're talking about like I want to talk about mysticism, but I also want to talk about science. And I think that it's important to kind of have a little bit of both, right? You got to kind of know what you're talking about. If you want it to go anywhere, anybody can speculate or say crazy stuff or believe one book they've read or one headline or whatever. But um, I think bringing people together is something that we've tried to do from the beginning of this podcast. You know, I love connecting people. You know, if some, I have somebody on my show and I know they'd be good for somebody else's show. I love doing that kind of a thing or vice versa, you know? So uh, yeah. it's all about community and, you know, connecting people as, as far as I'm concerned. Absolutely, man. I mean, honestly, like what I'd love to do in the future, I mean, I'm talking about down the road is, you know, just continuously raise the funds and you know, DMT Quest could sponsor like podcasts, like all sorts of podcasts, your podcast and dozens of others. Cause 
you know, you guys have good content, but it's not like you guys, you know, sponsors are knocking on your door to really support you guys in in the wow. way that they should. In fact, so, I even have to get some of our stuff free review, you know, like even though we talk about stuff scientifically, like the psychedelic stuff, I think it's still a little touch and go on YouTube and social media and stuff. You know, you can't be just spouting off nonsense. So, um, yeah, but yeah, I mean, that, that, we would appreciate that. Obviously that happens in any way we can, you know, help you in any way as well. Like obviously get the word out more and stuff like that. I, like I said, I think you're doing great stuff and I think that you just keep doing what you're doing and be passionate about it and it might lead to some serious breakthroughs because I think we're due for a paradigm shift or a scientific revolution at this point based on the way science has been stagnant, just focusing on the minutia and that slow crawl that's been going on for the last 50 years. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, sometimes you need an outsider with a different perspective to shake it up and, you know, maybe that's my role. I don't know, but uh, I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing and uh, hopefully I can go ahead and, carry out what I feel needs to be done and support everybody in the process. I think that that's a must and that's, that's in the cards for everybody. Well, listen, man, that's amazing. So I just want to say everybody go again, go check out. I have the link for the documentary down below. Also go to dmtquest.org and, uh, he's got, uh, his books on there. He's got, you know, do you have merch too? I think you got merch. I got merch too. And the book, everything in the books is for free. Okay. So you don't have to pay for it if you want to just read it on the digital, but if you want a hard copy, you can buy one. All right. I like that. That's awesome. But yeah, support him, you know, buy some merch. You know, if you like what he did with the documentary and you want to help this thing grow, let's, let's get him some loot here, you know? Um, so yeah, go check that out. And, uh, yeah, I'm really excited to see what you come out with next. And, uh, like I said, I was kind of, in, I was kind of taken back You know, obviously I, we talked a little bit before, and I know you had like a YouTube, you know, YouTube going a little bit. Um, but when I looked at you sent me that documentary when you released it that day, that there at that point there was only like a couple hundred views. I'm like, this is this is fucking awesome. This is gonna be huge. So Yeah, you guys got a hundred thousand now. Keep pumping this bad boy up. Everybody go check this thing out. <laughs> I appreciate the kind words, fellas, and I appreciate you guys having me on. And you know, we're looking to go ahead and change the world in a real way, and it's gonna happen. I just, you know, you just got to be patient, but I want it to happen sooner than later. So, One you know, step we're all good. time. We're all if you follow us on YouTube, I mean, look, we, we don't have th that many more than you now, you know, but if you follow us on YouTube and you like psychedelics, go go follow DMT Quest on YouTube. I just, wonderful. I just subscribed. So, there you go. Right on. <laughs> <laughs> All One right, more well, to join the beautiful. army. Well, listen, John, thanks for coming on. And anything we can do to help you and your cause, let us know. And uh, we'll definitely have you back on in the future. For sure, man. Thanks for so much for having me on. And sorry about the mishap with the timing earlier. Oh, dude, no worries. Right. No dude, worries you'd at be all. So, to do a live show, it's the most, it's the biggest pain in the ass in the world, man. Between yeah. connections and lining people's times up and time zones and this connection and that. It just becomes, you know, very hectic. We like doing live shows because we come from that school of like musicians like Fish, Grateful Dead, that kind of stuff. But, yeah. um, you know, that's why we like improv and live stuff. But at the same time, it is kind of a pain in the butt sometimes. So I hear you, man. Well, thanks for the support. And I look forward to uh, doing what we came to do. And hopefully I can go ahead and sponsor you guys down the, down the road at some point. Dude, that beautiful, would be awesome. beautiful. Yeah. So again, go check out his stuff one more time, dmtquest.org. And check out the DMT Quest documentary. Uh, and, uh, if you like what we do and you haven't checked us out yet, go to patreon.com slash mind escape podcast for just $2 a month. You'll get exclusive content segments and episodes. Uh, we do have a, uh, a $5 tier, which would get you into the fan chats. We just did a fan chat last week, which was fun with Sandy and Sean and, uh, Cole and a, and a couple others. And uh, we like doing that. We like talking with people and connecting with people. So check that out. And then for the $10 one, we're going to be doing another secret episode here soon. Uh, so that's where we do outside the box stuff. You know, maybe in the future, like I said, we're going to do some experiments, some music jams, you know, stuff you wouldn't normally see on podcasts. So check us out on there. Or you can just go to mindescapepodcast.com and make it easy. And one more time, please go to injuresweb.org. It is the platform we created to connect open minds whether we're talking about, you know, psychedelics and DMT and endogenous releases, or you're talking about, you know, ancient civilizations, you know, or whatever the case may be, UFOs, whatever the case may be, that's the spot to do it. So go set up a profile on there now, please. So we love everybody. 
thank you again, John, and uh, everybody stay safe out there. Peace. Peace. Right on. Thank you.